Hey, what is going on? It is Crypto Bobby. I hope you're having a great day, great night, wherever you're watching or listening in from today. I am not coming to you from my man cave. I'm actually coming to you from the Williamsburg Savings Bank in Brooklyn, New York, Williamsburg. And we are here for Fluidity Summit 2019. And as the great Pomp or Anthony Pompliano once said, long Bitcoin, short the bankers. Hence why we are in a large, what used to be a bank, now an event space with a bunch of bankers. So join me for a conversation with a number of people throughout the cryptocurrency, blockchain, and finance space. Let's hop into the interviews. I'm sure you never you've never gotten this once in your life. You were not on any Netflix documentaries. There's no there's a, No, I was on a Netflix documentary. We're on camera right now. I'm, I was in the Fire Festival uh, documentary. The one thing I think that's been pretty interesting to watch is just how like the market has developed in the past maybe month or so. And as somebody who is a professional investor in this space, what's your take on the overall sentiment of the the market as it's developed in the past like month to two months? Yeah, I mean, it's been really incredible from, um, first of all, like we've been investing through the bear, right? So we've deployed 20 investments from our venture fund um, in the last uh, 13 months. Um, we're focused predominantly, I wanna say on, everybody uses this term, but picks and shovels. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff is super early, but there's one thesis that's proven and that's crypto is a speculative asset class. And a lot of people, I think, are hesitant to say that, but what propelled crypto into the mainstream mind has, had been speculation on these assets for retail investors. And I think what will lead this next run and part of what we're seeing as kind of the price of Bitcoin shakes off news like a Binance hack, right? Or like this Tether stuff, which would have crashed the market last year. I think a lot of that is driven by a sense that institutions are seriously looking at this asset class and understand that some kind of allocation is important. And so we've been investing in the infrastructure um, that will support institutions coming into this space. I think that's a really interesting point uh, for a number of reasons, because number one, I completely agree with you that primarily to this point in time, crypto has been a speculative asset. And really, that's still the core use case. And I don't think we've developed or fully developed the, the majority of the other use cases that a lot of individuals point to. And to that point as well, one thing that I've been thinking a lot as it kind of spurred my mind recently, but with the Square, uh, I think it was Q1 earnings report, a lot of people were talking about Square and the increased amount of buying and selling of, of Bitcoin on Square. The amount of, of on-ramps and whether it's for institutional players or even for retail, like where we were in 2017 versus where there was the e-trade news right i think the team at wire has done a phenomenal job like they're everywhere every every company that we talk to is working with those guys um we we didn't invest in them you know wish we had um but yeah there's definitely there's definitely a lot happening um on that front for sure in the next six months, as you look at crypto as a whole, what's the most interesting thing to you? What are you keeping your eye on just in this in this industry? Yeah, I think we, you know, again, back to that institutional theme, really watching Fidelity closely. I think um, having a custody provider like Fidelity in this space um, is, again, crucial because even though it's simple to us, you know, going on Coinbase, opening an account, uh, you know, an institutional asset manager isn't going to do that, right? And and because insurance is still underdeveloped in the market for digital assets, really it's the creditworthiness of the cus of the custodian that they're trusting. And so, fidelity coming into the space is something that I'm watching. Um, what's exciting for us is finally a look towards from from the investment in Web3 stack. Finally, a look towards usability. Um, we're starting to see. Um, you know, the, the deployment of tech on top of, really it's a lot of it's happening on top of Ethereum. That's just making it so much simpler to use, right? Um, and I think that that's, that's critical right now. So we're not going to have actual use cases other than speculation until it's as easy for me to just sign in um, to some of these crypto primitives with, as if I would sign into Facebook. 
I think that's also a great point too. Like if you've seen some of the work with, I think Fortmatic is one doing some some cool things uh, on Ethereum. Portis is another one. Just yeah, just just making things easier for people. Company that we met with in LA called A Bridge, um, which is doing something similar to Portis. You know, it's just all it's and Crux, another one that's coming out. And right, we need to see the tooling. Um, you know, on top of these protocols in order for people to use them. And DAP developers use them, like even something like data querying, right? We've been looking and talking to the team at The Graph, which is a popular deal in the space, but as a DAP developer to have to build that out on my own and the amount of time that it takes and, you know, and cost, not to mention, to go and query the Ethereum blockchain, it's just really, it's crucial infrastructure is being built that's actually going to allow some people think DeFi is the killer use case, whatever, those those primitives to, to actually have users. Right now, like back to the speculation aspect, everybody wants to talk about ETH locked up in DeFi, right? If you look at Maker, most of that ETH is really just people want to have a leverage long position on Ethereum. So even though it's being used for DeFi, it's being used for speculation. Here with Clyde, who is say one of the more distinguished speakers that we have at Fluidity, definitely the best dressed I've, I've seen so far, at least. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Look, thank you for having me. And uh, I want to give a lot of props to Fluidity for putting this together. We're excited that uh, the blockchain businesses and distributed ledger technology businesses are thriving here in New York. And we're great. We're happy that you know, Fluidity put this together to, to show what's going on and to show off all the stuff that we have going on in New York State. And to that point, I think you just had a conversation on stage. You got a chance to talk a little bit about what New York is doing in the, the blockchain and cryptocurrency space, and then had a conversation that was uh, narrated, I believe, by Pat Barducci with Caitlin Long, who I think might take perhaps a little bit of a different approach with Wyoming. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how that conversation went with Caitlin? What were some of the maybe high level points there between the differences with New York and, and Wyoming? Look, in New York we go high, other places go low. She tried to diss New York when she came here. But in all honesty, uh, it was great to see what's going on in Wyoming. And with Caitlin, we have a lot of respect for her um, and a lot of respect for what's going on in Wyoming. But New York is not Wyoming. New York is the uh, financial capital of the world, but we're not guaranteed to be that. Also, with this technology, it disrupted and is disrupting the financial, uh, the financial markets uh, and the financial industry in New York. But how do we make sure that we lead in blockchain in, in, in the world in New York? How do we make sure we lead in fintech in New York? One of the things that's very important is that we have to balance a number of things. We have to protect consumers. We have to protect investors. We also have to make sure that we have an environment that's thriving for, uh, and, uh, for blockchain related companies to be able to thrive in New York. And how do we make that balance? How do we do that? And it's a challenge. One of the things that we're very proud to do is that in New York State, we're the first state in the country to be able to pass a law to create a digital currency task force. And this is a group of people, superstars, all stars, that'll help guide us with the policy and regulations around cryptocurrency, around digital currency, around blockchain to make sure that we get it right. As somebody who works in crypto full time at Fluidity and also has the kind of YouTube content podcast on the side, and basically I live in the cryptocurrency world, it's really difficult to stay, I would say, up to date and educated on what's happening in the space. What does New York State do to kind of keep a pulse on, on what's happening? Because from somebody who's come from myself, the traditional tech industry into the blockchain world. Things move so quickly here. How do you, how do you guys stay just abreast on all the, the, the latest happening? Look, it's a challenge for all of us. You know, it's a challenge for all of us. So we have to make sure that, you know, in this space, what's interesting is that, you know, to make sure that you're on top of everything, you can't read or watch traditional media, right? You have to watch the blogs. You have to watch what's going on in different companies. You have to watch different kinds of industrial uh, publications because this stuff is happening so fast. Um, but it's important to stay on top of it. One thing I was telling folks is that, you know, four years in regular, in, in, in this space, is like 40 years somewhere else. So, um, but what's a great thing is that it's humbling too, because you don't know everything. And there's so much that's going on. That's why it's important for New York to watch what's going on, not only in Wyoming, but what's going on in Texas, what's going on in Slapia, what's going on in Uganda what's going on around the world, what's going on in Asia, uh, because, you know, all this stuff is connected. Another thing that's a challenge, too, is that, like I said, we want to make sure that New York stays premier in this industry. 
But when it comes to technology that disrupts everything, you know, how do you do that? That's a, that's a challenge. And it's challenging every industry. But we have to make sure that we get it right here. Yeah, I have, I have a lot of, I think there's maybe a lot of, of grief that sometimes gets given to certain like regulatory bodies. But I think that just in the blockchain and cryptocurrency world, it has changed things so quickly that I can't imagine the, the position that it puts you know, someone like yourself and your team in and just having to kind of quickly adjust as to maybe not deter innovation, but at the same point in time still try to protect individuals because there's, there's a pretty tough dilemma there. One thing I didn't say on stage was that what's great is in every industry you have bad actors, right? You have bad actors in every industry. And I think it's good when people, when industries, when, when, when certain companies get outed, get, get, get caught, when, there are, when Ponzi schemes get caught. Because what happens is that we need to purge the bad ones out. But what's very important um, is that good companies and good actors need to step up. And, and, and I said, as I said on stage, we have to make sure that um, education is very important, right? Acknowledgement is very important. Uh, that the fact that you guys are doing this uh, is something that's important because I believe in New York State, in New York City, this industry is operating in the shadows. Um, and then and what happens is that then there's going to be a certain kind of relationship between this industry and lawmakers and regulators. And that's something that I'm trying to close that gap. Well, I appreciate you coming to the Fluid 80 Summit as well as taking the time to speak with me. I think you know, this type of conversation is, is really helpful and really illuminating. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks a million. I'm happy to be here. And like I said, I'm excited that Fluidity is doing this. Uh, to, I learned a lot and I'm going to try to stay here for a little bit to learn a little bit more. Um, but it's important for us to make sure that we, uh, we communicate and that this industry communicates with regulators. I'm, I'm really focused on, you know, events like what happened with Binance just this week uh, are really preventing the adoption of crypto because it really scares potential entrepreneurs, potential users. Um, and I'm really working on ways to leverage the technology itself to avoid events like that happening. Or when events like that do happen, in the case of Binance, it was an intrusion, a hack. So what we care about is identifying those intrusions faster, so having faster response time and alerting the community of them so that they don't uh, put their money, their wallets in harm's way. So I'm really uh, doing a lot of research and creating tool sets for that purpose. What do you think right now with the current, I would say maybe cryptocurrency ecosystem or infrastructure, what do you think are some of the biggest issues when it does come down to preventing the, the types of things you're trying to, to fix, like the, the fraud and the hacks? Yeah, I think um, we have been thinking about the problem, uh, putting our traditional finance hat on. So I, I used to work at a bank. How you prevent fraud or how you identify fraud or scams or financial crime is really by taking a look at at, um, rules created by the regulators and you um, and those rules may be around identifying criminals and telling the banks hey don't allow those criminals to uh, access the system and you and and that's how it's done regulator gives you a law or a directive banks apply it and that's how you stop financial crime and I think people have been trying to follow that same thread to crypto networks uh, but they work in a very different way they work in different um, uh, frequency, response times, different participants, you don't have uh an inter a broker of trust really creating those laws and you also don't have the linkage to government defining those laws so we need to redefine the question and make a native blockchain solution to find those answers so as opposed to waiting for the regulators the banks to say this is what a financial crime looks like go out and try to find it we need to tell the community hey this is a decentralized environment. You are not just a user, but you should be the gatekeeper of financial crime. Tell us, tell the community when you identify something bad and let's crowdsource that solution together. So I, I really think it's about redefining the solution so that it's not about copying what exists today, but about creating something new that is made for blockchain by the blockchain. Yeah. And so you said previously that you had worked on some of JP Morgan's blockchain initiative. And I think one thing that's really interesting is, at least from my feeling, like JP Morgan has some really solid alumni in the cryptocurrency space. It seems like they've done like a really 
good job. I think they occasionally get some grief for Jamie Dimon's comments on Bitcoin, but there are a lot of people now that have started working in the blockchain space that started at JP Morgan and now have now they're gone off to work at different companies or doing their own thing. What what type of I guess like thing just working at JP Morgan in regards to the blockchain space like what were you able to learn there do you think that was like helpful for you to work in like a larger corporate environment in that space yeah I think um, a couple of things I think one was JP Morgan really identified early on that they were that they wanted to do research on the space and invest in uh, learning and research and development in that space so one is the concept of time of being able to have you know from uh, 2014 15 16 when you didn't really see a lot of um, uh, testing, learning, uh, R&D labs in Wall Street, we were starting early on. So that, that the concept of time and being uh, one of the early adopters really allows you to um, adapt, learn more, and all of those things. The other thing is that um, with blockchain, one of the coolest things is your ability to drive adoption, your ability to um, attract partners along the space uh, to be able to say, yes, we're going to create a network together and we're going to test this out together. So one of the things that I really enjoyed about working at JP Morgan was the ability to not just look at a niche um, geographically specific problem, but looking at things from a global perspective, multi-market perspective, and at the same time being able to tap partners around the world for feedback around what are the types of use cases that could be useful for you. So one is um, one of the things that I think you're seeing all these sort of JP Morgan blockchain veterans creating new cool solutions is because, you know, we've been doing it for a while, learning and testing on it, but also it was a great experimentation ground because we had access to a lot of experts and global partners uh, that could really help us iterate and prototype quickly. I'm here with the man, the myth, the please, legend, please. Frankie Scoops. I put on my pants two legs at a time just like everybody else. Do you though? I do. Yeah, just jump in on them. <laughs> so there was just a panel in uh, Fluidity Summit yep. that was Caitlin Long and Clyde Vanell from, Caitlin is from Wyoming, Clyde is from New York. Yeah. And Caitlin had some interesting commentary on some recent situations in the crypto space. Hit me with your take. So obviously you have Wyoming that's doing a lot of innovative stuff with blockchain technology, um, regulatory guidance and such. And Caitlin's been at the forefront. And yeah, she brought, she brought the heat uh, coming down on this uh, poor assemblyman who um, I think they started some innovator group here in New York as well. Um, and she was going after like every single regulator that has that have been in the headlines over the past couple weeks. First, the New York Attorney General's office for being unfair, I guess, to Bitfinex, which, you know, was in the news for that crypto capital <laughs> debacle. Yeah, really. And then she went after um, Bittrex, or no, not Bittrex, uh, the New York Department of Financial Services, for coming out with that Coindesk article in which they sort of blasted them for publicly defending themselves after New York uh, Department of Financial Services denied their bit license. So it was interesting to sort of see the really strong anti-regulatory uh, um, dialogue take place in a space that I feel like has been so much moving away from that sort of libertarian bent. I think we need it, you know, we need a little bit of it to sort of keep it keep it you know somewhere in the middle it's funny too because i think coin center just posted like an hour ago i don't even know what's happening but it was senator sherman our uh good friend in the cryptocurrency space who has not been a fan of i think he's a senator has not been a fan of, of cryptocurrency but he literally said i guess in front of congress within the past like two hours all cryptocurrencies need to be banned in the united states so it has been really Jeff interesting Joseph stiglitz well so there's also i don't know if you know about this but in our home state of new jersey home of the tail ham egg and cheese, Bon Jovi, and, and the Garden State. And got three bills, and us. Well, you'll, you'll notice that you actually called it by the correct, yes, exactly. the correct thing. It's, it's, it's Taylor ham, it's not pork roll not pork for you Southern New Jersey degenerates. No, but they have three bills in, in Congress or in their state legislator that are crypto. I don't know if any of them have been reported on, um, but one of them is to possibly create an alternative to the bit license. So that could be interesting. And I think it just speaks to, you know, regulations and regulatory issues are kind of at the forefront, at least right now. And so there's something you mentioned earlier too that I think is, is kind of interesting, just 
the the companies that are in this like decentralized ecosystem that are in some ways maybe moving towards more of a compliance focus or trying to, to fit into a regulatory kind of framework. Can you talk a little bit maybe about that at a high level? Uh, yeah, I broke, um, there's been some interesting uh, uh, situations at MakerDAO with one faction sort of breaking off entirely. And then the, the, the main faction led by Rune um, is looking to get a broker dealer. So, and I had heard that Dharma was also looking into that as well, um, but I think they're moving more towards different state licenses to operate their business because they don't necessarily see the cryptos they're engaging with as being securities. But it is fascinating that you have these so-called DeFi companies uh, realizing that they need to be compliant and, and that having a label of DeFi or, or you know, decentralized or whatever have you isn't going to keep uh, regulators from serving them nasty grams in the mail. It's all, it's all fun and games until regulators and lawyers get in the way, and then, right. then all the fun gets out of it. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> protecting consumers, I guess, is the goal. So the past month has been, I think, a busy one for probably you and, and the greater team at The Block. What has been the most interesting story to you in the past month that you've worked on personally? I mean, I just love when we can flood the zone with stuff, meaning where we have a story that breaks like a Bitfinex and it just carries throughout and we have to sort of deliver to our, like the, where the readers are just so thirsty for the next update and to have it explained to them. And so Bitfinex was the latest. Um, and I, I, it's definitely gonna, that's gonna take the cake. I mean, just every day it's a new detail emerges. First, it's that they're sued by the New York Attorney General's office. Then it's that only 74% of the reserves were, uh, you know, there to begin with. Then it's crypto capitals coming in, and the, uh, it turns out that almost every exchange has worked with them: Kraken, Binance, etc. And I mean, that's what's fun about news. And keeps you, me busy. But I get a little help from my buddy Jack Daniels. You picked an interesting space to be. A journalist in so i think it's it's fun though for at least for me on the outside to to kind of watch when you guys do break news which is and it's also crazy to see what happens just in general with like the market like i remember seeing there was there was a there was a trade block chart of when you broke the bitfinex news and then i think a little bit later it was I for, it was the journal and then it was coindesk and <laughs> Frank, Frankie throwing in the heat. Uh, so, but there was a, you know, there's some price stability for a while, and then all of a sudden it just went off a tank. But if you listen to the block, hey, maybe you made a nice, maybe you made a nice short move. Maybe you got out early. So exactly, that's what that's the benefit of being first, you know. And you know that's what Bloomberg does. So when they have a story that goes out, it's on the terminal for 15 minutes before it goes out into the main, the main web. I've I've never been a legit user with uh, you know with a with the terminal so I'm I'm just a just a poor former Oracle guy not not a finance bro so I don't have that but I appreciate you coming on man it was great to speak as always scoops absolutely thank you thank you very much. talk to me a little bit about the difference in mood and sentiment this year versus last year for sure so um last year I would say. The industry was really, uh, there were a lot of people who weren't particularly involved in the industry yet, but were really curious about it. So the conversations were very exploratory. There were a lot of people trying to understand what's happening here, what can I create in the space? And this year I would say that's been grounded much more. People have built a lot of um, applications that are already being used. So there seems to be more um, people who are doing things, real world applications and uses. So the conversation shifted a little bit, but I would say Say for us at Fluidity, it's the same in terms of crowd. We actually have a bigger crowd this year than we had last year. Um, I think with the emergence of uh, blockchain and institutional finance, we have a lot of folks from the institutional world who are here this year and getting involved. Yeah, it has been. It's been interesting to watch from the standpoint of, of Wall Street because that was a big subject of discussion last year. I think even like Mike Novogratz's conversation was like the herd is coming. That was a big focal point of it and this year I don't want to say they're like here in the sense that they're 
absolutely investing in cryptocurrency, but they're they're in attendance at Fluidity Summit. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, they're definitely in attendance. They're a part of the conversation. They're in the programming, and there's a lot of uh, you know backdoor meetings happening as well, and deals being done, which has been really cool to um, to witness that happening.